Good afternoon. I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you all so much for joining us for today's program, Planning the Holocaust, the Impact of the Vonsi Conference. I'd like to start by thanking our community partners for this program, Big Brothers and Big Sisters Lone Star, Congregation to Ferret Israel, Legacy Senior Communities, Temple Shalom, Southwest Jewish Congress, and the Texas Holocaust, Genocide, and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. We sincerely appreciate your support. I'd also like to give a special welcome to our museum members and our board members joining us today. Thank you so much for your continued support of the museum. We could not put on programs like this without your support. We present today's program as part of our permanent exhibition highlight series. The timing of today's presentation on the Vonsi Conference is especially significant as January 20th marks the 80th anniversary of the day when high-ranking Nazi and German leaders came together to plan the next steps of the final solution. If you have not yet had a chance to visit the museum, I invite you to do so and explore our Vonsi Conference installation in the Holocaust Shoah Wing where you can view the profiles of these perpetrators. Before we get started, I would like to briefly introduce today's distinguished speaker. Dr. Matthias Haas is the head of the Education and Research Department and the Deputy Director at the House of the Vonsi Conference Memorial Site and Education Center. He is the curator of the traveling exhibition, The Vonsi Conference and the Persecution and Murder of the European Jews. He has worked as consultant, lecturer, and educator in the fields of politics of memory, European integration, and international exchange programs. Dr. Haas has worked for a number of organizations, including UNESCO, the Federal Association of Civic Education, the Korber Foundation, AMSIAD, and several museums and memorial sites. Dr. Haas joins us today from his home in Germany. We'll leave plenty of time for questions at the end of the program, so please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen and type out your questions, and we'll answer as many of them as possible. And now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Haas. Thank you. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a Tremendous pleasure and an honor for me to be here with you today. Uh, I would like to thank the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, especially Caroline Fangman, Annie Black, and Mary Pat Higgins for inviting me and us as an institution uh, to cooperate in, uh, on this event. Um, I come from the house of the Wannsee Conference, the historic site where the Wannsee Conference was held. And I started sharing my screen that you get an impression. Uh, what I will talk today. And um, I will talk a little bit about rethinking the Wannsee Conference, uh, the final solution on the Wannsee Conference 80 years later. Um, and I will explain a little of that later. So I come from the house of the Wannsee Conference, the historic site where uh, the Wannsee Conference was held. Our focus is on its history. And uh, that is a site of the perpetrators. So we look through uh, the lens of the perpetrators and their actions. Our focus as an institution is education and we do many educational programs um, with a variety of professional groups from police and the military to nurses and training and apprentices of chemistry and of course, school classes. We work with federal ministries and raise questions about professional ethics in history, but also today. And all of our groups work on the history of their profession during National Socialism and the relevance of this history for them in the fields of work today. And of course, they all address the Wannsee Conference as a key event in the process of the persecution and murder of the European Jews. So my presentation today is about the Wannsee Conference in its larger historical uh, context. And after an overview of the meeting uh, um, and some of the participants and the overall context, in the second part, I will try to present to you an, an approach that we took in the last months 
uh, while working on the 80th anniversary and with a number of events. And we curated an exhibition with the title Involuntary Remembrance on the Significance of the Wannsee Conference in History and the Present Day. And I will briefly outline some of the, uh, 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 that exhibition uh, where we're trying to think differently uh, of this meeting and its meaning for us today. But let us go back and oh, here we see the site of um, uh, the, the house of the Wannsee Conference as it looks today. That's the institution where we work. And as you see, it's a, an old mansion, an old villa, um, but rather small. So on September 1st, um, um, let's, let's look at the situation in January uh, 1942. Uh, we all know on uh, September 1st, 1939, World War I begins. And with that, not only a war for territory, but also for the racial new order of Europe, as the Nazis called it. And the main target of that were the Jews. And with the invasion of the Soviet Union on June 22nd, 1941, the systematic murder of Jews began, men, women, and children murdered by the Einsatzgruppen, the mobile killing squads of police and SS. And by the end of 1941, so before the Wannsee Conference, more than half a million people were murdered. And so this is the setting where, when the Wannsee Conference was held. On January 20th, 1942, a meeting took place at Lake Wannsee in Berlin. There was only one topic on the agenda of this work meeting with breakfast afterwards, as it was called an invitation in which lasted around 90 minutes only. The final solution of the Jewish question in Europe. How to organize the deportations and murder of 11 million Jews of Europe. Reinhard Heydrich, the head of the security main, Reich security main office, invited 15 officials from the police and the SS, the administration of the occupied territories in Eastern Europe, the party chancellery and various ministries. Heydrich was authorized by a directive signed by Göring on July 31st, 1941, to carry out all material and logistical measures concerning the final solution of the Jewish question. His aim at the meeting was to highlight his leading role in the organization of the genocide, to secure the cooperation of the participants and to make everybody aware of what final solution meant, mass murder. Heydrich's initially planned conference date, December 9th, 1941, had to be changed following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Germany declared war on the United States on December 11th. Let us now look at the situation of Europe at that time. You see that in the middle, the, the darker blue, that's Germany, the German Reich. The light blue countries, that is uh, the, the countries and territories occupied by Nazi Germany. The more lilac countries, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, uh, semi-independent right-wing authoritarian regimes dependent on Nazi Germany. Fascist Italy, of course, an ally. So the, the European continent is uh, ruled over by Nazi Germany. We are winning the war. That's the, the mentality of the men who convene at Lake Wannsee. Yeah, the battle over Britain, it seems a matter of time. The army, the German army, the Wehrmacht is at front of Moscow. So whatever we do, we can do, that's their thinking, because we have the power to do so. The racial new order of Europe is a reality that we can start uh, sort of uh, uh, realizing. The decision to murder all the Jews in Europe was probably made during this period. Historians are still debating the concrete date when the decision was made. And there is no key document signed by Hitler that gives evidence, as we have, for example, for the euthanasia killings, the murder of people with disabilities. But we have evidence through a series of meetings and speeches that mid-December 1941 was probably the time when Hitler in coordination with Himmler and others, made the decision to deport and murder all European Jews. Now let's, let's look at the meeting. Who was at the meeting? We have 15 men here. This is not the first row of the Nazis. These are not the political leaders, not the people in the ranks of ministers. 
These are what we call uh, Staatssekretäre, permanent secretaries in the ministries, the heads of the administration, the people that know how to run the show, so to say. Um, what do they have in, in common? Well, these 15 men, their average age is 42. Uh, they are pretty young at the time. They come, with the exception of two, from middle-class families. We have 11 Protestants, three Catholics, and one a believer in God, so the Nazi term for sort of sort of, not, of Nazi faith. We have, most of them were from Prussia, but two from Saxony, one from Bavaria, one was from a, a Russian German from the city of Odessa. Seven of them, almost half of them, had fought in World War I but eight belonged to the war youth generation that was too young to fight in World War I. And in, in a way sort of try now to win the war that the generation before had lost. 10 of the 15 went to university, eight of them had been awarded doctorates, which of course was much, was much easier at the, at the time. Eight were lawyers, they had went to law school. Some were old fighters, joined the Nazi party in the 20s already. Some joined in the early 30s, 31, 32, but even some of them only after there was a ban to join the Nazi party, only joined in 1937. Nine of them were in addition to being a party member, members of the SS. Some were members of the Reichstag. So we have a pretty average uh, uh, gr uh, group here of, well, okay, young, well-educated, men, and of course they all convinced of the Nazi ideology, they had careers. They are pretty high, not the highest, but very high. But from the background, ordinary Germans. We do not uh, have one uh, uh, person presented here uh, who was not very recognized for a very long time, and that was a secretary. Why is that important? Well, this is for these men a typical work meeting. And at a work meeting on this level, you have a secretary that takes notes. Um, and, and that is sort of in our understanding of the, in the internal proceedings, quite interesting. And a, a colleague of mine, a historian, did some research on her and found out uh, that she, there was a secretary from the office of Adolf Eichmann, uh, who in coordination with Heidrich wrote the protocol, the meeting, um, and she came and was his most trusted secretary. Her name was Ingeborg Wallemann. She is a young woman of 23 years old, um, born in 1919, married an SS man, uh, and after the war went back to her normal life. She was never questioned, she was never, never arrested or uh, never tried for being part of this, but for a long time, it didn't seem interesting what these ordinary people working at the desks had to say. But I think it's quite interesting to also look at people on the sides. And we see, um, oh, and after now looking uh, at these men, let's see at the protocol itself. Adolf Eichmann, uh, who was in charge of Jewish affairs within Heidrich's Reich Security Main Office, wrote the protocol and he used coded language to summarize the results of the discussion. The extermination plans are only outlined. So we have the first page and a half, which I didn't show here to you, are just participants. And then we have an overview of what Heidrich, uh, Heidrich gave an overview of what happened so far. And on page five, we have the first sort of hint to what is planned. As a further possible solution, and with the appropriate prior authorization by the Führer, immigration has now been replaced by evacuation of the Jews to the East. However, these operations should be regarded only as a provisional options, though in view of the coming final solution of the coming final solution of the Jewish question, they are already supplying practical experience of vital importance. And from this, these sentences, uh, we can also very clearly see that they already talked uh, about a change in policy to mass murder. There's no emigration any longer. We now evacuate the people. And that's a term for deportations. So if we have on the lower levels of the administration people cooperating in this, we have no questions. Well, what is evacuation or resettlement transports? There's nothing wrong with that. 
a deportation train might be something different. They are already talking about practical experience of vital importance. We have a man at the meeting, and I will come back to him also in my second uh, part, Rudolf Lange, who comes as the commander of the security police in Latvia, in the city of Riga, to this meeting. And on the 19th of January, day before the Wannsee conference, he is still in Riga, is the commander of the killing of 1,000 Jews coming from Theresienstadt, the concentration camp near Prague, Czech Jews being brought to Riga, unloaded, walked to the woods and murdered under the command of Rudolf Lange. Those are some of the practical experiences of vital importance that they talk about. And so, but they don't need to talk about killing. They know what is meant. On page seven, the protocol continues. In the course of the final solution and under appropriate direction, the Jews are to be utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner. In large labor columns and separated by sexes, Jew, Jews capable of working will be dispatched to these regions to build roads and in the process, a large number of them will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. And it continues on page, page eight, those who ultimately should possibly get by will have to be given suitable treatment because they unquestionably represent the most resistant segments and therefore constitute a natural elite that, if allowed to let go free, would turn into a germ cell of renewed Jewish revival. And in brackets, witness the experience of history. That's all what they need. They, and we see that here before, are utilized for work in the East in a suitable manner. We work them to death they, because they will undoubtedly drop out by way of natural reduction. We exploit the labor of the, of the people and, and kill them through labor. But they don't need to be sort of explicit about it. And then they, and those who survive that will have to be given suitable treatment. And so it is very clear if we read these words carefully that there is only one way of reading them. That is the one who survived that slave labor will be killed. And that is a typical bureaucratic document. Uh, that's, that's the coded language, that's the distance language that these men use. And that they give to the, the lower levels and they all are in agreement what they were planning and doing and they know uh, what this man, meant. What we know from Adolf Eichmann in the trial in the 1960, 61 in Jerusalem is that at the meeting, they were quite explicit. They talked openly of wiping uh, out and killing and getting rid of. But here in the official document that Eichmann wrote, um, we don't see any of that. What we see on page six of the protocol is a statistic, a statistic that Eichmann put together before the meeting. Um, <clears throat> and that is divided into two, uh, sections A and B, and it names territories and countries of Europe, the Altreich, that's Germany, the Ostmark, that's former Austria, part of the Reich now, the occupied Eastern territories, and so and the general government, the occupied part of Poland, and continues Lat uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Greece, Norway, the countries that are under German control. And category B, from Bulgaria over England and Finland to the Soviet Union, where we either still fight the war and we still need to win this war against England, against the Soviet Union, or where, as in the case of Bulgaria, have to send our diplomats. And these diplomats have to negotiate sort of who is going to um, uh, hand over their Jews to our administration. Um, and we see the numbers of Jews that are estimated to live in these countries, territories, in January 1942. And if we look at Estonia and the category A, we see that's already free of Jews. The murder had begun. The Einsatzgruppen had killed the Jews in Estonia already. At least that's what the official numbers suggest. So, um, and, and there are mistakes in these, uh, uh, in these numbers. If we look at category B, for example, Serbia, Serbia is under German control, and it's mentioned as, as it is not. 
The numbers in France are much too high. It is until today still unclear if the North African Jews were meant, meant with this. So there are mistakes, but and we have to question these numbers, the statistics. But here for the participants at Vansi from the different agencies and ministries, it is uh, sort of these, the, it's not 11 million people. It's a, it's, it's a number, it's numbers in the countries that have to get away, they, they have to disappear. They, they, they are planning to murder these peoples as a problem. And that is where it's clear what they are talking about from the practical experiences to uh, over the, the suitable treatment that have to be given to people who survived the slave labor to uh, these numbers. It is quite clear that we have really the document that uh, talks about the Holocaust. And coming back to the men um, uh, who were here, it is interesting to look at, also at the agencies and institutions that, is, that they come from. We see on the left-hand side, uh, Heydrich, the second on, on the top from the, from the left, Reinhard Heydrich, and he brings his men. He brings the head of the Gestapo, Heinrich Müller. He brings Adolf Eichmann, and he has these two police commanders, of which I had mentioned Rudolf Lange, to this meeting. We have another main office of the SS. So we have police and SS here. We have the party chancellery next to Heidegger. The Reich chancellery, the administration of Hitler as the Reich chancellor. But then we have the occupied territories, the general government in occupied Poland, the ministries uh, for the occupied Eastern territories. And then the last four are regular German administration and ministries. The plenipotentiary for the four-year plan, economic planning, war industries, the foreign office, the Ministry of Interior, and the Ministry of Justice. So the whole administration of the German state is involved in this. So it is quite clear from the protocol of uh, the meeting what the final solution was. It was the planned murder of 11 million Jews of Europe. And coming back to the three goals that Heydrich had, one, securing his leading role, two, asking for cooperation from the attending ministries and organizations, and three, making everybody aware of what final solution meant, he had reached two of them, the three goals, quite easily. His authority was backed by a letter of Goering, and he had made everybody aware what final solution meant, in case people were unaware, and even that is highly uh, unlikely. The third goal was a little bit more difficult, asking for cooperation for a program of mass murder. How it was phrased in the invitation during the meeting was Parallelisierung der Linienführung, parallelizing of the procedure, in order to have one procedure for the Europe-wide deportations to the death camps in occupied Eastern Europe, Heydrich needed cooperation. And that is the result of the Wannsee conference. Everybody was willing to cooperate. Nobody hesitated and looked for a way to not participate in the genocide. Nobody could have done that openly, but there are always ways to play the system. Oh, we are overworked. We are understaffed. Well, we can't take on one more task. Nobody did that. They all looked that their field of work was not affected, but if it was not, they were all willing to cooperate. And if we look at, uh, for example, of Erich Neumann, uh, the, the fourth from the right um, on, on that chart, and he is in charge of slave labor. And he asked, and the protocol here was only mentioned once, he said, oh, what about the Jewish slave laborers? My task is to really take care of the war industries. And then Heidrich says, no, no, your Jewish slave laborers will not be deported before they will be replaced by civilian slave laborers from mainly Eastern Europe. And then Neumann is fine. Next to him on the right, Martin Luther, from the Foreign Office, the undersecretary from there, he comes with an own wish list, wishes and ideas of the Foreign Office. And so it is very clear they are willing to cooperate and are complicit in the crime. And of course, bureaucratic language helped. Not once the protocol talks about gassing people, about mass shootings, about murder. Everything is described in different terms. But it's quite clear that murder was meant. There's no other way of reading the protocol. 
And from the post-war testimony I've mentioned, that it is a quite clear that the participants were uh, aware what final solution meant. So here at Van Vanzi, the murder of the European Jews was not decided, but it was coordinated by leading bureaucrats how it was going to be implemented and carried out. The Europe-wide the Europe deportations were a central part of it. The perpetrators who gathered in Wannsee joined the Nazi convictions rooted in racial anti-Semitism with a sober and objective understanding of their bureaucratic profession to create an effective plan for the genocide of the European Jews. The Wannsee Conference signifies the willingness of German state officers to cooperate in the Holocaust. The conference participants became accessories to and perpetrators of the genocide with several agencies and hundreds of thousands of civil servants and police participating in its execution. Now, let's have a look of the post-war situation. What happened to the perpetrators who met at Wannsee after the war? And the short answer and the disappointing answer is that nobody was ever tried for participating in this meeting. If we look a little more careful, we can differentiate it into three groups. One third died before the end of the war. If we take, for example, Reinhard Heydrich, he was killed by Czech partisans as the leading Nazi in, 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 in Czech, uh, Bohemia, Moravia, uh, being stationed in Prague. He was killed by Czech partisans um, at the end of May uh, 1942, just five months, four and a half months after this meeting here. Uh, he was heavily wounded and died a few years, a few days later. One other third is tried for other crimes. Let's take, for example, Josef Bühler from the general government. He's handed over to Poland for the crimes he committed in occupied Poland, sentenced to death and executed. And of course, the most known is Adolf Eichmann, who escaped to Argentina after the war, was kidnapped by the Israeli Secret Service, brought to Israel, tried in Jerusalem sentenced to death and executed. But the one third of the participants was never tried. Some of them were imprisoned for only a short time after the war and lived integrated into post-war society in Germany. And the last participant who died was in 1987, Gerhard Klopfer from the party chancellor. And we see here the obituary of his family in the paper. The doctor of law, Gerhard Klopfer, uh, died, oh, they mourn who uh, Mr. Klopfer, who died after a fulfilled life to the well-being of everybody under his influence. That is sort of the mentality that still existed in the late 80s in Germany, at that, in that case, West Germany. On the other hand, that caused a scandal. It was a regional paper in Southwest of Germany and it made nationwide news because at that time it was clear that uh, what the Wannsee Conference was and he was not uh, lived a fulfilled life, life uh, to the well-being uh, of everybody under his influence. And that brings me to my second part of uh, my presentation. Um, when we did this exhibition, uh, now for the 20, 20th of January, the 80th anniversary of the Wannsee Conference and also the 27th of January, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we, we didn't just wanna do a historic exhibition about the event itself. We wanted to address the, the, the aftermath and the difficulties to remember. We wanted to rethink this history in, our, in, in its meaning for us today. And that's why we came up with the title Involuntary Remembrance uh, on the significance of the Wannsee Conference in history and the present day. For us, it was important to connect the history of January 1942 to the history after 1945, as we see here in this obituary, and show the relevance of this history today. Um, we also wanted to show a multitude of perspectives. We didn't only want to talk about the perpetrators, but also show what this history meant for the victims, meant for Jews living in Europe, in Germany, in Poland, all over uh, at the time. Uh, so we have the tension between different uh, documents that we wanted to, 
uh, present. And we have a variety of sources, official Nazi sources, but also testimonies, diaries, um, quotes, last letters by some of the victims. And I'd like to give you, uh, show you a few examples. You see that here, that is how this exhibition looked at the German Bundestag. Uh, yes, there is a lot to read, but uh, the complexity of the, the issue thought, uh, seemed uh, is important to, to present also uh, some text. And I would like to come back to Mr. Lange, for example. One of the chapters of, um, uh, of the exhibition deals with the question about decision-making. The image of Wannsee is that at Wannsee, it was decided to kill all the Jews. And we know that is not true. We, we know the murder, and I, I presented that to you, the murder had begun already. And still, we did not want just to say, oh, this is wrong. But it seems that for many people, a crime, a historic event of this of this importance needs a specific date, 20th of January, a specific, specific place, Wannsee, and a number of people, the 15 participants, to connect a decision-making process to this. But if we look at the history, it's a process that gets more and more radical. It's a, it's a, a killing procedure where they, they learn from their experiences, where they find other methods of killing, and it, that's very hard to grasp. In our exhibition, we, we show this history by showing that Mr. Lange already killed Jews in Riga in December uh, 1941. And we see a quote from one of his reports, 27,800 Jews were executed in a major operation in Riga in early December 41. And Max Michelsen on the right-hand side, a survivor from that uh, city of Riga who lost his parents in these killings, uh, in 10 years, 15 years ago, gave an interview and he said, we were already dead before the Wannsee Pump. The killing had begun. And I mentioned on 19th of January, 1940, uh, to Rudolf Lange supervised the murder of 1,000 Jews from Theresienstadt. On the 19th of January, and that's also a story we tell, a young Jewish man, escaped from Kulmhof. Kulmhof is the first death camp that operates with gas vans. And Schlama Berwiner, this young Jewish man, had to help to unload the, these gas vans and bury the corpses. He escaped from this camp on the 19th of January, 1942. He goes to Warsaw and gives a report to the underground archive uh, on a Shabbat, Shabbat the, the underground archive from the uh, Emanuel Ringelblum and his co-workers. That's the first report that we have from a mass killing by gas. And he explains here uh, the operation uh, by killing and, and unloading the, the people, uh, the, the, the corpses uh, that were uh, so that is the evidence that we have. We have evidence by the victims. We have documents, and we see this history here really on this 19th of January. It comes together from two very different perspectives. Um, so that is, I think, important for us to see the, the different sources, the different perspectives, and how history happened at the same uh, time at, at, at different Times. Schlama Berwiner, who gave this report, uh, was brought from Warsaw to the city of Zamosh in the southeast of Poland, but then was deported a few weeks later to the Belgians' death camp and was murdered there. But he gave his report to a man named Herr Schwasser, and Herr Schwasser survived the war. And we see him here um, on, this, um, on this photograph together with Rachel Auerbach, and Rachel Auerbach um, is uh, also working for the, for the underground archive. And here we see them after the war, uh, un, uh, digging uh, up these boxes where they documented the killing. Um, and you see here a quote um, from uh, Rachel Auerbach, all Jews should know whether they wish to know it or not. Every effort should be made to communicate the truth to the non-Jewish world too. And one chapter of our exhibition asked about whose history is this? 
who writes history? Why, uh, who, which sources do we have? Um, and, and for them, it is important that everybody knows. We must know. Uh, we need to face the facts. The world needs to face the facts. We need to write our own history. The, the Nazis want to wipe us out and destroy our history. So even if they kill us, we need to tell the story. And, um, and our bus approach of writing our history, the history of the Jews of Europe, written by Jews themselves, is relevant for us today. In, in, in looking at questions, whose history is it? Who writes the history? Um, and from which perspective is it written? Because we see also that on the side of the perpetrators or the side of German society after 1944, 45, there was a clear unwillingness to confront this history and to write this history in a self-critical way. Oh, we didn't know anything about it. Nobody could know. And for a long time in post for history, but the Jewish perspective of the victims is no, we tell the story. And within this group of Hersh uh, and Rachel Auerbach, there was also a historian a survivor named Josef Wolf. And we see him here also helping by looking at these documents. Josef Wolf was born in, in Chemnitz in Germany. He grew up in Krakow. He was deported to Auschwitz, survived the death march, and after the end of the war become, became an employee of the Central Jewish Commission in Warsaw. And he's seen here in the retrieval of the first part of the Oynik Shabbos archive in Warsaw. He first lived in Poland, moved to Paris, and then he settled in Berlin, in Germany. And he was the first historian that published the first extensive body of research on national socialism and the extermination of the German Jews. And in the 1960s, when German society was unwilling to face its own responsibility, Wolf tried to establish an international documentation center about national socialism and its consequences at the house of the Wanze Conference. Uh, and, and, and that is really uh, groundbreaking for looking at the site where I work today and, and trying to bring this to the public, to the public attention. Josef Wolf failed to, uh, uh, to, to build this documentation center, and it was only opened 1992 at the 50th anniversary uh, uh, of the Wannsee Conference. But our media uh, center and library is named after Josef Wolf. And for Wolf, writing the history of the Holocaust was his life theme. Um, and I think it's also important to see that, that, uh, it, it, that one of his coworkers and we see a quote here from him, uh, how important that was for him. Wolf's life and work cannot be understood in any other way. That was what moved him and kept him going through 30 post war years. The thought of the millions who were murdered and the self-imposed duty to do everything to ensure that this murder would never be forgotten. But he also said, um, and, and that is sort of shows the tension. Oh, you in, in an interview, Josef Wolf said, oh, you are coming with a Jewish point of view again. That means nothing at all. Look, national socialism is not a Jewish issue. National socialism is a German issue. The murder of his people, of his family, his communities, of the Jews of Europe, of course, that's Jewish history. But national socialism as a, as a, a history itself is something German society needs to address. And on this photo, we see also uh, up on the shelf a quote, um, Sachar, six million, remember the six million. And the, the, see here on the photo um, that he was already always reminded of the murdered and the survivors. And his task was that they will not be forgotten. Josef Wolf tried and uh, hoped uh, that German society was willing to take on that task um, and confront itself with this history, but it took a long time and his hope uh, was bitterly disappointed. Josef Wolf took his own life in 1974. His wife had died a few months earlier, but he was very disappointed in German society. He said, you can document until you about the crimes, until you blew in the face, you can have the most democratic government in, in the city of Bonn, and still the perpetrators go free and have, uh, plan, water their plants and have their little gardens. And it took a long time, and that's what we 
try to, uh, I try to bring across here is to come to terms with this past is an ongoing issue. And the meaning of the Wannsee Conference from different perspectives needs to be discussed until today. So, and I'm coming to my end now in uh, rethinking the Wannsee Conference. It is important for us to connect the historic events of the history of the Holocaust with the post-war history and our societies today. We can make connections from Rudolf Lange as a participant of the Wannsee meeting to the victims and survivors, to their testimonies as essential parts of writing this history and to the dynamics in post-war Germany in coming to terms with this history, which for a very long time remained involuntary remembrance. But to make this, these connections with sources from various perspectives and with a broad variety of sources enable us to deal with this history is a dense narrative that shows us that this part of history is still relevant 80 years later. Thank you very much. And I hope there will be some time for discussion. I'm sure there will be. I will stop my presentation. Thank you so much, Matthias. We do indeed have some questions coming in. And again, if you have a question, please feel free to use the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, our first one takes it a, uh, a little bit before the Vance conference. Uh, this guest asks, I've read in a couple places that the infamous July 1941 Goering instruction to Heydrich, um, so the letter where Goering uh, writes to Heydrich um, and asks him to submit a plan for the final solution, may have actually originated with Heydrich, a sort of reverse letter authored by Heydrich taken to Goering and signed. He's asking if you have uh, any thoughts on that or an opinion on that theory. Well, theory, I think, yeah, that is the case. I think that's from what we know is that um, uh, Heydrich, why does he go to Goering? Goering is in charge of all Jewish affairs. So after the November pogrom, uh, Goering is in charge. And Heydrich now, and it's, for him, it's a question of power. He wants to have that task. It is not something where Göring comes to and says, oh, look, I, I need somebody here. Heydrich, it's you. No, Heydrich uh, uses his influence and uses anti-Jewish policies as, as a power tool. And he says, look, I want to be in charge. It's a question of influence, of, uh, of, of power. And so he goes uh, with this letter probably to, to Göring and lets him sign it. He has it in his desk for a couple of months and uses it at, in that uh, point in time. Heidrich is not the only one who is organizing murder. We have the higher SS and police leaders, uh, the Höheren SS and Polizeiführer, and they are not under control of Heidrich. They are under the direct command of Heinrich Himmler. And many of the, of the killings that in, from March 1942 on in, in the general government are organized by the higher SS and police leaders. So their killings is, is a sort of, they use that as, uh, as uh, gaining power, of having influence, of managing this, this murder uh, for their own personal gains. We have another question. Uh, you mentioned the secretary who was present at the meeting and taking the notes. Do we, do you, we have her name? This person's just curious if, if we have her name, he'd like to look into her more. There is not too much. Uh, her name is Ingeborg Werlemann. Um, she is 23 years old. Um, she was, um, after the war, uh, interrogated a few times in, in a few trials um, about other uh, perpetrators. She says, oh, you were a secretary. What did you know? Were you ever at Wannsee? And she said, yeah, well, I was at Wannsee probably twice. I think that was in 1944, and Heydrich was present. And da, da, da. and here we see clearly she's lying. She's because Heydrich is dead in 1944. Oh yeah, and as many of them, yeah. Well, I can't remember too well. Um, and that's um, but uh, from thinking about who were they, we have the list of the secretaries, and from that that list, a colleague of mine did some research and and, and put the things, the pieces of the puzzle together. Um, she survived, she, she got divorced after the war, and I think from the early 50s on, lived together with a woman. Um, she never had a public career in any way, uh, but what we know from colleagues is that she was a convinced National Socialist. She was convinced of that. And clearly at the meeting, she heard and, and wrote down 
what was said and had no objections and no problems and thought, oh God, I, I might get a better or different job. She didn't do any of that. Um, it's interesting that these, these normal people, the small figures, these, they were never of interest to historians. And um, Ingeborg Werlemann only died in 2010. So she, she became, and that's not long ago. And at the Wannsee Conference, our institution was open for, for 20 years almost. And still we, I have to say, I, I didn't work there, but, but we, did, we never cared. We, we historians, we political scientists never cared about the small people. One historian once called a different secretary where he knew, oh, she was, uh, and that woman picked up her phone and said, oh, are you that? And did you do that? Oh, and she responded, do ne never call me again and hung up. So they, until their end, uh, the end of their lives, didn't want to talk about it. We have another question that is probably not going to be easy to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, so you mentioned the, the participants in the conference were, it came from fairly ordinary backgrounds. They were mid to high level bureaucrats. Um, we have a guest asking what convinced them that this was the right thing to do. Is there any indication in their backgrounds of, you know, I think it's kind of the ultimate question when we talk about the Holocaust perpetrators sort of across the board, but anything in particular about the, the people who gathered at the conference? Well, that's one of the key questions and one that's one of the tough ones. Um, we wonder what makes them do this? And and, and from what I presented from their backgrounds, there's nothing typical. Yeah, they went to the universities and they were on the extreme nationalist right uh, and they were anti-Semites. It's interesting that anti-Semitism in the protocol does not play a role at all. But that is of course the operating system. That is the whole system that they work on and function on. At, on that, in that place in, in history and that time and these men in the level that they are, there is no need to think about why the Jews, of course the Jews. For them, of course, that is a that is obvious. They are the problem that needs to go away. We all, we all know this, right? My grandmother and grand-grandmother, she already knew that. They are the problem that needs to disappear. Nobody said, wait a minute, why again? What's going on here? No, no, I mean, that that ideological background is deeply rooted in them. And, 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 and of course, to understand this event and the, the meeting of the protocol, anti-Semitism is, is essential, is important. This is not just something. This is not about, oh, these or them or, um, no, it's the Jews. But why that is so clear that we don't need to talk and address this. And I think that is the, in a way, the scary part that it's so, it's, it's in a way stayed so vague. Um, but no, they were normal. And for, I think for German society, and again, um, why do we connect a decision-making process to Wannsee? because then we can push it away also from us. Oh, those 15 men, they were, it, it's not. But no, it's, it, these were thousands being complicit in this, doing their little part. And if we, uh, did the Germans know about it? Uh, well, what does that even mean to know about anything? Did they know the Jews disappear? Their neighbors are gone? Yeah, sure they did. Did they expect them to come back? No, everybody was clearly aware when they disappear, and when they buy their belongings at public auctions, they expect them not to come back because otherwise I would not buy the hat of my neighbor. And we have lists from auctions where people bought a hat, a hat and a hat, run rice mark. And we have the buyers and these are the neighbors. And so the awareness of that is very clearly there. And that makes it scary and interesting to see that these were ordinary, ordinary Germans, ordinary people. Yeah, e easier for, for us to process if they were all monsters, but of course we, we know that that's, that's not the case. Um, another question that came in, to your knowledge, when we think about other historical genocides, do we see anything in the planning process for other genocides like the Vonsei Conference? I mean, this is such an administrative meeting, you know, we, I think we almost don't like to think about people planning it out um, this way, but, but do we know of any other instances like that with other genocides? Yeah, well, it, it's, the, the, the unfortunate thing is we always look at things in hindsight and then we see, oh, there is a warning sign and there is a warning sign. Um, and, and that's very hard to say. And, and it, it's um, not every form of discrimination against others leads to genocide, but it's not something. And that's when we, 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 we started now really at the beginning of the war in 1942. But of course, we, we need to start talking about this the latest in 1933 with sort of 
in hindsight, again, innocent discrimination. What is that? But it's not murder. It's not violence. You just, just a, a separated from majority society. You are not equal any longer. You, you can't do this. It's just small, small steps of discrimination that lead to being outcast, to, to have a hierarchical thinking of, of, peop of, of people. We are better. We, are, we, the German race, the Aryan race, the German blood, whatever that is, it's all made up, but we are superior. And then we have other races and the Jewish blood, the Jews are on the bottom. And, and then at a certain point, we do see them as fellow humans. They are, uh, and then they are not, they, then they are a problem to go away. So it's a step-by-step -step procedure. And we see that on many levels of genocide. If we look at the propaganda that's needed, if we look at Rwanda, where it doesn't happen just out of the blue, but we have a machinery of propaganda beforehand. We have a, a propaganda that separates people and makes us better than the others. And, and so there is a, a path leading towards that, more and more radical. And we should be aware of, uh, we can say, okay, well, they won't go further than that. No, no, wait a minute. If you are on that path of radicalization, and that's what we see with the Nazis, we have a more and more radical uh, policies. And that is what, it's a learning administration. Okay, that takes too long. How can we kill people faster? And th that step-by-step, -step, I think, a procedure and the more and more radicalized uh, way of discrimination um, in that mindset, I think these are the steps that, that we can take from many different mass crimes leading up to genocide. We have a question. You you spoke at the beginning quite a bit about the, about the language used in the protocol and sort of how it's uh, sort of veiled. They knew what they meant, but didn't necessarily write down the words mass murder. Um, so this guest is asking, why were they so concerned with euphemistic language in this protocol if they were so confident of the rightness of their mission? Um, does it reveal any kind of awareness of uh, the monstrosity of what they were doing that it might be ultimately judged by history? Do we have any sense of that? Um, at this point in time, I doubt that, but it's a, it's a secret rights matter, the protocol. It's not openly um, distributed. We had 30 copies of the protocol. This is number 16, the only surviving copies. At the end of the war, the Nazis destroyed their, their documents. Um, but I don't think that at this point in time, they uh, thought about losing. I think that's, that's not so much on their minds. One, um, I think what, what they uh, do is they need cooperation on all levels, not only in Germany, but at, it, the research has shown even in the occupied territories. In Germany, in, in France, the Germans have 3,000 policemen forces, and they need to organize the deportations. If they organize a deportation train the, and ask the French police, please round up Jews, bring them here, and we put them on trains to be deported, the French police might say, wait a minute, what are you doing? Deportation to where, to what? They might ask questions. If you resettle them in the East or you evacuate them, well, that sounds innocent. That sounds not too bad. So that is something. The German policeman, the German um, uh, tax off inspector who, who auctions off the belongings of the Jews were, that were resettled, evacuated. He can talk himself at least, sort of, not asking, not thinking further, Oh yeah, sure, they will be resettled in the East. That is all propaganda, they could know because we are fighting a war in the East to have Lebensraum, to have living space for us. Wait a minute, we, our boys are not dying on the Eastern Front to settle the Jews there. That's all, that, that doesn't make any sense. But that, that's an effort already. So that is, I think, something where they needed other people to be uh, sort of complicit without thinking too much about it. Mm. And we have speeches from, from Himmler where in 1943, he, he talks to killers, to murderers of his SS units and says, look, this might be a, a page of glory that might never be written because we know this was historically necessary. And you all know what it means if 100, 500,000 bodies lie together and to have seen that and faced that and still, uh, stayed normal and, and, and um, stayed, remained uh, anständig, um, sort of orderly and, and, and correct, correct uh, man. That might be sort of this leaf, this page of glory that might never be written because our, our people 
we are the elite. They might not be ready to face the historic necessity of this, of this, these, this killings, of, of wiping out uh, an entire people. You mentioned the copies available of the protocol. We actually have a question about sort of the archival side of it, um, which is, did the protocol uh, undergo any serious revision as a result of the meeting? And are there any earlier drafts other than kind of what the final draft ended up being? Uh, we don't know. We don't have the notes from the secretary. We don't have earlier. We have only the copy that was sent to the foreign office. And we only found that because the Under Secretary of State, Martin Luther, he lost his job um, in, in late 19, I think, 43, in an, when he tried to replace the foreign minister in an internal power battle. And, and he lost his job, was sent to a concentration camp. And at the end of the war, when everybody destroyed their documents, his documents were bundled up and put into an archive. And so that's why the Americans found them. But we don't know that. And from the protocol, what we have, what's interesting also, there are a lot of sort of markings in that. And to recognize that as a document in itself of historic importance, it took more than 20 years. For some of the trials, some of the prosecutors uh, asked for the original and they got it and they got their pens and marked things after the war and said, oh, this is interesting and this is interesting and this is interesting. So that's why some deniers claim, oh, this is all fake, this is all made up. Um, but we, the, um, I think the Americans, they uh, microfilmed the protocol in 1946. And uh, so we have the original, which with some of the markings from, from prosecutors in some of the trials post 45 and from the 60s, but we also see at least an original in a microfilm uh, in the form of, of, of the original. I, full disclosure, the person who asked that question was our director of library and archives, and she just added another comment that she can't believe an archivist just came across that 20 years later. I can imagine from her perspective, that would be quite the discovery. Oh, yeah. And, and I think for us today, it's just, but, um, and, and today the original is in the political archive of the foreign office and the archivists there say, and, and I think even at the time, the head archivist who had it under his control had to give it to the prosecutors, he got, was got furious. But these, these, these prosecutors said, look, that's our job and we, we don't care about it. It's not a historic document. We have trials going on here. This is so, and um, for us today, it's quite unbelievable, yeah. I think we, we have time for two more questions. So this one is a little bit more about the representation of the conference uh, in uh, popular culture. Uh, this person asks about the movie Conspiracy, which came out about 20 years ago. Uh, I'm guessing you're familiar with it, um, and he'd love to hear what you think about its accuracy, what you think of the film in general. Um, that's an excellent question because that film is 20 years old, and just now a new film came out in Germany uh, by the main TV stations with a uh, um, film company, which is quite different. Uh, there are three movies altogether, and one is a German production from the late 80, uh, mid 80s, 83, I think, then Conspiracy, and this new one, Wanze Conference. And one uh, conspiracy, I, th I think it's, I mean, this pop culture, it's, these are all movies. They're all made up. They are all give an impression of something. Um, and, and conspiracy, Kenneth Branagh is, I mean, he's a Shakespearean actor. And this is how he plays Heydrich. Do I think Heydrich was Shakespearean? No. But still, I think there is a value in this film. I, I, I don't think it's accurate on a lot of levels. And still, it might help us to get an understanding of it. Um, in that film, we have sort of as a counterpart of Heydrich, we have Wilhelm Stucker from the Ministry of Interior. And he was not. He was opposed to minor uh, sort of measures against Jews, half Jews, one quarter Jews to be deported or not. Um, but he was not opposed to the overall deportations and, and murder. So in, in that case, you have, as I always say, you have the good, the bad, and the ugly. Sort of you have a movie. You have, you have that way of, of presenting it. Um, and I think the newest film for, uh, for us, and we, we, we helped in some parts, it is very close. And I think it will come to American movie theaters or will be, be streamed soon. Uh, and it just came out on the 20th of January here to the 80th anniversary in Germany. And they really play it as a very, very narrow story around the table, 90 minutes of mm -hmm. more or less sitting down. Even there, to make it a story, we there are inaccuracies. But, but I think what's interesting there is um, 
the way they interact in a very calm, uh, non-dramatic way of, of, of talking, competition between that, and you always wish for the good one. You, you wish for sort of having a counterpart, and at certain points you think, oh, that might be, he might not be too bad, but no, you don't. It, that newest film does not let you, doesn't give you an, ex, an exit, an exit to somebody to identify. With. They are all evil in their, and being normal and being so, yeah, just normal people. But I think it's worth seeing them and comparing them. And I, yeah, it would be interesting to, to hear your thoughts on the newest movie as well. Do you know the, the title of, I guess it's a German title now, but what the English title would be of the one that just came out so we can look out for it in the American market? Manze Conference. Okay, easy enough. <laughs> I think we can, we yes. can keep an eye out for that. Um, our final question um, is, is taking it back to today. So you've talked a little bit about um, sort of the course Holocaust memory and the memory of National Socialism took in Germany. But how is the work you're doing today being received? Are you still getting pushback on acknowledging some of this history or have things sort of transformed over the last few decades? Oh, that's, uh, we have another half hour, right? Good. That's <laughs> um, I think today, I mean, we exist as a memorial site for 30 years now. It's the 80th anniversary of the Banzer Conference and the 30th anniversary of us as an institution. And over time, we have an, a, still a growing interest in our work. Um, at the 50th anniversary of the end of World War II, 1995, I remember the debates as, okay, now it's, it's over 50 years. From now on, interest will be on the decline. And the opposite is true. Numbers and memorial sites go up. The interest is there. Uh, the the Arlson archives, the archives with a lot of material on the Nazi past, just did a, a survey of the interest of young people um, and the interest in the topic and the in the issues that we deal with in the younger generation, 16 to 25, is growing. We address important issues to them, not only of historic relevance, but also of a relevance for them today. Well, having said that, we have, there's always the people lament and the, parents, the teachers and the parents say, oh, they have no factual knowledge. They don't know what was going on. That might be true, but the interest in the topics is there. And that for us means we have to, to see and ask ourselves, how do we teach this topic? Our teaching methods and addressing methods, I think, are important. And on the other side, we have also, I mean, and I would never have believed that. If you have asked me seven, eight years ago, Will there be an, a growing anti-Semitism in German, European society internationally? Will there be conspiracy narratives and theories? No, 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 please. We've learned, I mean, at least that there is some sort of enlightenment. And I think we are all heavily disappointed. We, and, and we have parties in, in parliament. Say, oh, this was just a, um, a, a, a bird's poop. Uh, in the glorious German history, this whole Nazi past. Uh, this is just not important. And so and in this, in this exhibition we have, we debate that. We debate and, and try to present the questions, how important is that history today? We think it's relevant. Many people think that, but we have also people who, who, who deny the importance or come back with, with theories, with narratives where we thought, God, that, no, we need, don't need to to address those, but well, obviously we need to. Yeah, it's um, the, the case of we, we all wish we could be out of a job uh, <laughs> to yeah, a certain extent. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Matthias. I think we're we're at time now. We, we luckily got to most of the questions. I apologize if we couldn't get to yours, but thank you again to Matthias for joining us. Um, I hope you, you get a little rest soon after your many, many events for the anniversary. Um, and appreciate you making us part of that. So thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you next time. Have a great rest thank, of your day. Thank you very much for having me and good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.